This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm Brandon Pollan, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, F. Scott Feel. And tonight, we are humbled to have a very special guest tonight joining us. Tonight, we have the one and only Dr. Gail Jensen. Now, for those of you who don't know who she is, Dr. Jensen is a well-known physical therapy educator and qualitative researcher. She serves as the chair for the Ethics Committee for the Nebraska Physical Therapy Association. Dr. Jensen also serves on several editorial boards and is currently deputy editor for Physiotherapy Research International, along with being the associate editor for Physiotherapy Theory and Practice, and she is also on the editorial board of Qualitative Health Research. She was selected to give the 2011 Macmillan Lecture titled Learning, What Matters Most. She is a faculty associate for the Center for Health Policy and Ethics. She is a dean of the Graduate School and College of Professional Studies and the vice provost for learning and assessment at Creighton University. University. Her areas of research include clinical reasoning and development of expertise, novice development, ethical reasoning and clinical practice, scholarship of teaching and learning and ethics education, and reflective mindful practice. Now, Dr. Jensen, first of all, thank you so much for coming on our show today to talk with us and our audience as we're very excited to hear your insight. And also, thank you so much for all of your contributions to the realm of physical therapy education as you've truly been a very prominent and influential figure. Now, I do realize that I kept your bio brief, but is there anything that you'd like our audience to know about you that I didn't mention in the intro? You know, Brandon, well, first of all, thanks thanks for having me. And I would say the most important thing for my colleagues to know is that always my core identity is as a physical therapist. So regardless of what I do in my daytime job, which is mostly administration and go to meetings, or my role as an education researcher, you know, my basic core is my identity as a physical therapist. And, and that's really what drives me in terms of the, the work that gives me uh, great joy and, and working with uh, other younger colleagues to develop and grow. So the other thing I'd say is that across my career, I have always worked across disciplinary lines. So I've always been drawn to those kind of fringes, edges, whatever you want to call it, working with OTs, you know, working with other health professions. I did quite a bit of work in the school of pharmacy and health professions with OT and pharmacy. So working across uh, disciplinary lines has been sort of part of my, my core being. And now in my role as dean of the graduate school, I have to work in the interdisciplinary space, which is not easy, uh, but it's very challenging and rewarding. Yeah, Dr. Jensen, that's a great take on things. I I love that interdisciplinary stuff. We've been talking about that with a lot of guests um, and how we really need to start getting outside of the silo of just physical therapy because there's so much to be learned out there. For our audience who doesn't know, you've been working on a grant activity called Physical Therapist Education for the 21st Century with a few others. Do you think you could give our audience some background on the specifics of what that entails? And, And maybe could you give them an insight on what you're learning as a result of doing this? So let me start with uh, mentioning another thing I didn't say up front is that if you look at my, you know, my CV, I've always uh, worked with other people. So I've always collaborated. To me, collaboration is, well, it's more fun. The work is always richer and better, and it's it's easier to move things forward. So this study that we did, and my colleagues, Terry Nornstrom from Samuel Merritt University, Lori Hack, Emeritus Professor from Temple, Elizabeth Mostrom from uh, Central Michigan, and Jan Guire from Duke University, we worked together as a research team, and we did what's called a Carnegie-like study. So the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching engaged in a study of professions about four or five years ago, and they looked at clergy, law, engineering, nursing, and medicine. And their focus was really on understanding professional education in a way that would help us understand things across professions that could help improve professional education. But their their focus was on innovation and excellence, which was 
was in contrast to, if you all remember the Flexner study that was done 1910, the Flexner study was a Carnegie study, and that looked at medical education. And that study revealed everything about medical education, bad and good. And it led to transformation of medical education that lasted a long time in terms of having a hospital for clinical education, having really strong foundational sciences. So when Carnegie did this set of work under the direction of Lee Shulman, who was president of Carnegie at that time, it was to focus on excellence. So if you focus on excellence, you also uncover what's not so good. We met with Dr. Shulman. We were able to get some of the methodological tools from folks that had done medicine and nursing. Uh, And so we embarked on a study of excellence in innovation in physical therapist education. And what we found, one of our first observations was, wow, we went to six academic sites and five clinical sites. We used a national nomination process. We do have two papers that are that are in press right now with physical therapy, a part one and a part two on this national study. So you'll be able to read a lot more about it. But one of the first things that hit us is we wish all our colleagues would have the opportunity to do what we did in travel to these sites because the work happening in both academic and clinical organizations that are really really strong, excellent programs is quite amazing. (laughs) <laughs> we were blown away. Another very, very important uh, observation we had was how interdependent the academic and clinical communities were. They can't exist without each other. So what we call this nexus, the kind of coming together of the academic and clinical world, was a central element of excellence. You can't separate the two. And in fact, our conceptual framework, which emerged out of our work, we didn't say, well, this is what's excellence in academic programs and this is what's excellent in, cl- in clinical sites. That's not the case at all. This is what's excellent regardless of where you are. And and no surprise, there, I'll give you a, a couple kind of high level things. The culture of excellence is really about those deep-seated beliefs and values for high expectations, strong leadership and vision, respect for one another, and this importance of partnerships with the practice community. And then a focus on both being learner-centered and patient-centered, depending on where you are in that process. And then on the learning side, very important was what we call the praxis of learning, is the importance of what's called practice-based learning. Learning in clinical practice, we know from lots of education research is the most powerful learning. It's learning that sticks. It's it's robust. It's full of emotion. And it's the exact reason why those of us in academics, when students come back from the clinic, they come back and say, oh, I learned so much. And you go, you didn't learn anything from me? But the, the reason they learn so much <laughs> is just that community of practice has all these elements that is so important in learning. The other thing we found is that there are important things about adaptive learning and how you facilitate that. The Carnegie studies also also identified a signature pedagogy for each profession. In medicine, it's teaching at the bedside. We've identified for our signature pedagogy, that's a pedagogy or a teaching approach that's unique to physical therapy, is the human body is teacher. And another element we had was professional formation. But also important here is while we found a lot of excellent work going on in the teaching and learning environment, not a lot of really good understanding of learning science. So the need for more education research for fully understanding learning is is pretty critical in our profession and, and would really help move us forward. The other piece, not unimportant, is we looked at organizational structure and resources. And there's not one model out there. We, f- we found lots of good models, different models uh, and approaches that really support excellence and in innovation. Papers are in press and they're out ahead of print. The galley copies should be ready uh, pretty soon. Awesome. Can't wait to read those. Yeah, for sure. Dr. Jensen, for our audience who is not aware about the Macmillan Lecture, do you think you could tell our audience a little bit about what the Macmillan Lecture is and how one gets selected to give that lecture? Sure. Really, the the Macmillan Lecture is the highest honor that our profession grants, and it's a lectureship. It's usually someone who is mature in their career, I would say, and has something to say. And the lecture is to really do a couple of things. One is to to really speak to the profession of what needs to happen, where you see vision for the future, also criticism. But if you go back and look at the at the Macmillan lectures, it's it's to speak from what you know. So it's really to use that foundation or platform of your passion and where your work has been done. So it, it's a great honor. It's it's nerve wracking, and it's uh, you know when it's <laughs> over, it's it's wonderful. <laughs> and, and one of the things I did, and, and it's always written, it's captured and published in the usually in the November issue of Physical Therapy. 
is I went back and looked at the past Macmillan lectures. Usually most, most lectures do that. You, you know, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. And I, I kind of categorize the different lectures of, of their focus. But they, you know, they stand the test of time. Everybody knows Helen Hislop's, you know, the not so impossible dream. And I think these Macmillan lectures are really important lectures for students to be introduced to throughout their PT curriculum. Not all of them, but there are certain ones that fit in certain areas because it gives you a sense, a very important important sense of where the profession has been and where it is now. But the other thing you'll see, and we have some quotes in our, actually in our research, is if you go back and read, Catherine Worthingham 50 years ago did one of the first Macmillan lectures, but she also had a strong leadership position, a federal position, and she did a series of education research survey studies on basic physical therapist education. She published six papers. Her last paper really was kind of a critique of what she found and where the profession needs to go. And some of those things are still true today. (laughs) Things like we need better relationships between the university, the academic side, and the practice side. We need to pay more attention to what society needs from us. We need to work more in an interdisciplinary fashion. So it gives you a really strong sense of how difficult these issues are and how important it is for us to stay focused on them. Yeah, Dr. Jensen, you mentioned that, you know, you, you had gone back and kind of looked at some of the previous lectures and, and categorized them and stuff. Can you talk to us a little bit about your experience with preparing and delivering your Macmillan lecture? Sure. Well, the first thing, and I think all folks who do it, it, it's a year-long process, so you have a whole year to think about it. So, you you know, you're really thrilled and honored when they say, oh, you're going to be the next Macmillan lecture, and then you go, then you have a year of terror. <laughs> you have, and it's sort of always, it's always with you. Now, you know, people give different kinds of advice. I kept a, a journal. I just made notes. I was always thinking about it. Did a lot of reading, you know, read a lot of the Macmillan lectures, but also then talked to other mentors who had given the lecture before. I called Ruth Pertillo my philosophical consultant. I mean, she was terrific. And, you know, she kept telling me, she said, Gail, do this with something you really, really love. So that's how I came up with learning. You know, it's my background as an education researcher. I care about learning. It's important. I've done a lot of work in the area. So that was monumental. When you read the different kinds of lectures, it's helpful to have a framework. I used a framework of looking at learning at, at different areas, learning for practice. You know, are we a learning organization? So that framework helped me kind of put the ideas together. But of all the papers, all the writing I've done, I've I spent more time on this paper than anything I've ever written. <laughs> the other piece that's in the guidelines for the Macmillan Lecture is to always have some part of your personal narrative. And, you know, given my background as a qualitative researcher, I wove quite a few little vignettes and stories in my personal career, professional journey, which was fun and very meaningful. And so I hope, you know, I hope people read it and go, oh, hey, I learned something. This is going to change the way I ask this question or... Yeah, for sure. And I think even so, what you said about how incorporating stories into the content and delivering your lecture is so critical because it brings everything into more of a personal, real perspective. And I think whether you're doing that from a student or whether you're working with that with a patient, I think there's some definitely value in that. I think that's a great point. Let me make one more point because I mentioned the concept of professional formation. I also have that point in my lecture, but it was one of our findings, and it was one of the findings in the Carnegie studies, how important professional formation is to professions. And formation means beyond professional identity. You know, I'm a physical therapist, and now, you know, we have DPT degrees, and you have a white coat ceremony, and you have a code of ethics. It goes beyond that. It has to be how you see yourself, your responsibility and obligation. And that formational process is career-long process. And part of formation, I had great formation as a you know, as an entry level in my first professional program when I became a PT. I'm a product of an entry level master's degree program. And the seeds that were planted, I've always thought of myself as a professional and what that means and what my obligation is to society and to continue to learn and know and to have a strong moral grounding. And so part of formation, I think, for students is knowing legacy, is knowing about the association, is knowing about what these Macmillan lectures are about and knowing about what the Catherine Worthingham Fellows are, and knowing about, you know, the kind of research. I mean, it's easy to get kind of a very narrow view 
of the profession. But this formational piece, we all have that in common, and it's so important. And it comes through the mentors you have, the interactions you have, the people you respect and you go to, and it's really important stuff. Yeah, wow, that was a great take and great insight onto that. And with kind of going back into your lecture, your Macmillan lecture titled Learning What Matters Most received great appraisal, and I found a lot of it very intriguing and insightful. And of course, the link to the lecture will be posted in our podcast show notes for APTA members to access. But do you think you could tell our audience kind of the main key concepts and takeaways from your talk that weren't already mentioned before? Sure. Learning is really important on what I'd say both sides of the equation. Learning, uh, it's two sides of an equation for me. So we have to think about learning our own learning and what we're trying to do. It's the most important thing that happens to us across our career. And the better we understand learning, the better we can build our knowledge base when we think about development of clinical reasoning. It, it's about your metacognitive process. It's, a, it's not just critical thinking and reflection. It's your ability to manage the uncertainty, to see how you can frame problems from different perspectives. It's, that's all about learning. And educators that understand that or also do that intuitively help a learner, challenge a learner to go further. Just a connection here to our research is we found a lot of evidence in these excellent programs of the push for what's called the adaptive learner or adaptive expertise so that the learning is about learning how to learn so that you are constantly seeking more. You know where your gaps are. You can critically self-assess. If you can't critically self-assess, you're not going to learn. So that's absolutely fundamental. But the other piece about learning that's in here is we have to have a better understanding of the learning that we do with our patients in the communities in which we work. Also helping understand theory and how theory is our friend. It can be extremely helpful in helping us understand things. So I have a figure in the paper about human performance. And we've done a really excellent job in PT on the analytical side, looking at movement science, motor control, motor learning, that kind of, we've, we've uh, built up a pretty strong clinical uh, research base. We've done far less on the social cultural elements, the things that happen in the practice community that are extremely important it's called situated learning, and it has everything to do with, and any clinician can tell you this, it has everything to do with your success in patient care. And the, the other very, very important piece here is that we have a challenge. I mean, we don't have total control over patient outcome. It's a human performance issue. We can't make patients better. Patients have to engage generally in something to get there, just like a teacher or a therapist. So this is pretty well known that we're in a difficult profession. <laughs> and that's where this understanding of the social, cultural kinds of things, the learning piece that is not just an analysis piece is so critical. And, you know, I can tell you from the expertise work we did over a decade ago on expert practice in PT that master clinicians, they get this intuitively. They collaborate with the patient. They understand. They work together. They read the patient. And they have this very keen sense of listening and understanding the lived experience of the patient. So we need to do a better job, and that's part of my argument, we need to do a better job in bringing these worlds together because they're so important in what we do, and we need more education research. We tend to kind of have a too strong a focus, I think, and that's where a lot of the funding is too, but we need to develop a stronger cadre or cohort of education researchers and really understand learning. That's kind of a snapshot. The other thing I said about learning that's, I think, getting some focus and traction now is we need to think about how we develop professional competence across a career. What are those elements of competence? And there's some good work, conversations going on in that area, but we've had a very, what I would call, organic development of the profession. You know, not being critical, we're a young profession, but so, you know, first clinical specialties and the board of clinical specialties popped up. Then you had continued rapid growth in residencies. And so are these things connected in any way? And how do we look at milestones of development? We need to take a concerted look at that continuum. And I, I think that's going to happen in the next few years. 
Yeah, Dr. Jensen, I could not agree with you more. I actually uh, referenced your article in my dissertation that I'm working on right now, the expert practice in physical therapy article. So I'm working toward my educational doctorate. I could not grasp the fact that we're kind of stuck in this view of a necessary movement or, or trying to get out of the realm of just you know, higher learning and, and kind of problem solving, I think there is another level there. I think we do have to take it to, to the next level and start kind of theorizing, you know, not just problem solving, but, you know, take it to the next level. Like, you know, critical thinking is great, but I, I think there's more to that. And I think we do need to see more of that in physical therapy programs um, because I think it really does set the foundation for learning toward expertise. Yeah, let, let me make a, another comment here because it's a, just a simple example. But one of my mentors, Lee Shulman, is very fond of saying the most important thing that one does in the preparation of professions, in professional education, is that professionals need to be prepared to make judgments in uncertain conditions. So it's the ability to render judgment in on certain conditions. And Donald Schoen, the guru who, who did a lot of writing on, on the reflective practitioner, his notion was professionals practice in the swampy lowland of practice. That's why they need to be able to reflect or have these metacognitive skills. So we spend far too much time in education, and this is, you know, from the time we start kindergarten through college and and even professional school in educating for the right answer. You know, you can think about how many times you've been asked about the right answer. And if you're trying to prepare this adaptive learner, then we've got to begin to ask questions like, what didn't you understand? Where were you puzzled here? What's the most difficult part of this process? Where are the challenges? Where's the uncertainty? And that will really help the learner develop. But if you're just looking for the right answer, you're down an entirely different road in terms of understanding learning. Yeah, the, the questions that you pose there are just, that's where, to me, some of the best learning comes from. What kind of changes or, or adaptations do you see actually occurring within DPT education programs in the next maybe 10 years or so? Well, I'll point out one of our findings again is we included in, in our study the academic programs and clinical facilities that had residency education. And what we found is that when you have different layers, so you have different types of learners in these settings, you might have graduate students, you might have residencies, you might have fellows, the learning community is much more robust, it's richer, you see a lot of exchange, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So I think we're going to continue to see that kind of thing. I think we're going to get our hands wrapped around, our head wrapped around this, uh, the professional continuum. And I think that's going to help us. It's going to help structure education research, I think, help grow that. So I, I think we're on the move. I think we're going to connect the dots here with what happens in PT education. A couple of years ago, we presented some of our early findings at an education research meeting. And one of the things that happened, we had to show a slide, a PowerPoint slide, a visual to show how disconnected our education flow was. Well, here's the academic and here's clinical and it could be this, it could be that. And oh, we have these clinical specializations out here. And then we had, because we were presenting an audience where there were a lot of medical educators. So, you know, they've got this kind of lockstep <laughs> process. And we were trying to help them understand what we had, which was, which was interesting. Kind of switching topics here just a little bit. Dr. Jensen, with all of your experiences as being an educator, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned regarding being an effective educator? And in your opinion, what makes a great educator? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, all your questions are quite good, I would say. You know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that educators have to establish mutual respect. Teachers do. And I would say that, you know, my saying is if you, if you don't have evidence of student learning, you have no evidence of teaching. So let's, let's get that straight from the beginning. <laughs> if you have no evidence of students learning or engaging in their learning, then you don't have successful teaching. But fundamental to that is having respect for one another. Now, that's easier said than done. But, you know, at the professional level, you set expectations, mutual respect. I'm pretty clear uh, with students is that, you know what, you're my colleagues. Uh, you're going to be my colleagues. I'm going to treat you like, you know, with respect like a colleague. And I expect the same back to me. So I believe those, those kinds of things get set early. And they set the stage for good learning. I'm also very clear with students. I think the other thing is to say, this isn't about grades. <laughs> and I wish we could do away yeah, with yeah. grades, quite frankly. This yay. is this, thrice yay. 
this this is about this is about your development as a professional. And I'm not interested in oh, are you 80% competent? Which which 20% did you not know? And is that 20% I don't want you to know? I mean, come on. This is about becoming the best professional you can. You learning, you know, you have to have that kind of fire in your belly to learn. That's what's got to motivate you. The, the other thing that we found in our expert study was our experts were, you know, we talk about lifelong learners, but they were really lifelong learners. Several of them went back and got their DPT, even though they, you know, they were in their 50s <laughs> when we interviewed them 10 years after the study. So, so this drive to continually to learn and to withhold your judgment is very, very important. That you're continuing to learn. If, if you can't figure out a patient, it's not the patient's fault. Uh, you know, some of that I think is true too with students. We can be quick to blame students for some of our, you know, it's a two-way street. We, we've got responsibility mm-hmm. in that too. So I'd, I'd go back and I'd, I'd say respect. The other thing I would say about teaching is we know from education research that it's important important to really understand what the subject matter, what area you're teaching in, because evidence would show us that the better grasp you have of what you're teaching, the less content you teach. So, so think about that. Why is that? It's because you know what the learning goals are for that particular area. So I teach the ethics course in the physical therapist curriculum. I know what the learning goals are. My, you know, my primary learning goal is that I want to influence that student's ability to understand that ethical reasoning is part of your clinical reasoning process, that you have some absolute kind of understanding of your role as a moral agent, that you're your professional responsibility and that. So I'm clear on that. And that helps me make decisions about what's in and what's out. It's not just, oh, I need more time to cover this. It's, it's more about where, where do I want the learner to be? Wow. Dr. Jensen, thank you so much for your insight. It's, it's really been enlightening and an absolute honor to have you on the show tonight. We like to end each episode by posing a question to all of our guests. If you could change one aspect of higher education, uh, DPT or other healthcare education related, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? I've mentioned this before. I think this is true in higher ed. It's also it's very true in physical therapist education. We we need to support and develop education research. We need those kinds of young researchers to emerge and be supported and and uncover and codify and write about the education process, the teaching and learning process in, in physical therapy. I think that's really critical. And it goes back to really understanding learning. You know, we need funding. We need we need to take it seriously. We need to take learning seriously. We we just had Dr. Stephen Durning was part of a clinical reasoning symposium that was held here at Creighton, but it was it was sponsored by the education section, APTA. And he made a comment. This guy's a he's a physician, he's an he's an internist, but he also has a PhD in education. And he said, you know, I talked to my colleagues and he said, I just don't understand it. They can get millions of dollars to look at something of the brain that has no clinical translation at all. And he argued, he said, you know, if we have a better understanding and can figure out how to enhance clinical reasoning, we could change healthcare. We could change many things in healthcare. If we did a better job of the teaching and learning around clinical reasoning, I think he's right. (laughs) Yeah, I love that point of view. I mean, we really need to focus on being educators. You know, even though we're in the healthcare field, the bottom line is we're all educators and we all educate all day, every day, whether it's students or patients or each other. I mean, that's the bottom line. We got to put the focus back on education. I love that. For sure. No, that's good insight. So thank you so much for your time and insightful discussion today, Dr. Jensen. For our audience who's kind of not sure, where can people find you online? Uh, well, they can they could email me. I'm on my email all the time. I'm, uh, I'm not on Facebook. I'm very good on email. I know I'm a Luddite, but uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just Gail Jensen at, at Creighton.edu. Uh, and, you know, the other thing I tell students all the time. I said, you know, do not be afraid to contact people. I have to say, you know, somebody reaches out to me. I'm flattered, quite frankly. (laughs) I love to engage in conversation and uh, share resources and ideas with people. Uh, That's part of my obligation. It's part of my giving back or paying it forward or whatever. So never be afraid to reach out to people. That's important kind of networking that has to occur. So yeah, they can send me an email and yeah, I am sorry I won't be on Facebook. I don't Twitter either. Sorry. 
<laughs> well, that's all right. We're glad that we could flatter you with our request to have you on the show because it was an absolute honor and a pleasure for us. Thank you so much. Oh, you're doing great work, so uh, keep it up. Invite me back, you know. Let's hear it. <laughs> oh, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.